Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, Acts, the book of Acts today, chapter 19, and we resume our study in verse 13. If it's possible, get your Bible, open it up to Acts chapter 19. We'll begin in just a minute. A reminder to you that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. You can go there. You will find four complete series going through every single verse of the Bible, Genesis through Revelation, going on five. It's all archived. All you have to do is choose the series, the book of the Bible, the section, the chapter, however you want to study, whatever you want to study. Bring your Bible, a hunger for God's word, to the Bible, verse by verse dot com, and you are all set. And now, let's pray. <clears throat> and Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth, in Jesus' name. Amen. 19.13, Acts 19. I want to begin reading of verse 11. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. And certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them who had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. Of course, Satan scoffs at attempts to expel his demons by using charms or special incantations, which is how these Jewish ex ex exorcists would attempt to do it. And it was probably all fraudulent. They were not Christians. They didn't have faith in Jesus Christ. They didn't know the Lord. They were unsaved as anybody could be, but they had probably a pretty good game going there where they probably made some pretty good money. But they thought, hey, let's, we just found a new tool. Let's use the name of Jesus. Let's add him to our arsenal of, of trinkets and, and, and incantations that we use to supposedly drive out demons. So they used the name of Jesus as a lucky charm. And I don't have to tell you what God would think of that. But you're about to find out. Look at 14. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? This is a tremendous verse. Demons, we get some real insights here. Demons are foolish to reject God, to rebel against God. They are foolish for doing that. But they're not ignorant because they know what's going on in the spiritual realm. And because they're there. They've got inside information because they're right there. And so these demons knew that these Jewish exorcists were not saved. And therefore, these demons knew that these Jewish exorcists, using the name of Jesus, were firing blanks. They didn't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. They had no authority to use the name of Jesus. They were not in Christ. They had no special authority in Christ. They had no spiritual protection because they didn't know Christ. You only have spiritual protection when you're in Christ, and they didn't have it because they weren't in Christ. They had no authority to even try to cast out demons, and when you're talking to demons, you better be careful. This is why God says don't talk to demons. Talk to God about demons, but don't talk to demons. 16. And the man 
in whom the evil spirit was, leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded, just completely embarrassed. And if they weren't, they should have been. You know, superhuman strength is one indication of demonic possession, and that certainly was the case here. This man overpowered the Jewish exorcist, and then he fled naked. He was in a panic. 17. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Now, people... Now understand that both God and demons divide people into two groups. God divides people into two groups and only two groups. The saved and the unsaved. And so do the demons. That becomes very clear with this section of scripture. And people also understood that if they were non-Christians, they were on the wrong side. They had no protection against demons. Demons have absolutely no fear of anyone except the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this was an eye-opening experience for all the people in the area. They saw the importance of knowing Christ and the authority that comes with that and they saw the futility and the danger of playing pretend and using the name of Jesus when you have no business doing that. And by beating these non-Christian exorcists up who dared to use the name of Jesus, these demons actually unknowingly did Christ a favor because the failure of these imposters resulted in increased notoriety for the name of Jesus and for true Christians, especially the apostles. It resulted in greater respect for Christ, greater respect for the Word of God, and greater respect for apostolic authority. 18. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Boy, they didn't take long. After this show of power by the demons against people who were not saved, the Christians who at least claimed to be Christians came and they confessed all their sins. They wanted to make sure that they were truly right with God. Boy, the Word of God is powerful to convict and bring confession out of a sinful soul, isn't it? The Word of God can do what other things, including threats and torture and anything else, cannot do. Here people came repenting and confessing their sin because they saw that the Word of God was true. Everything that the Bible said, everything that the apostles who spoke the Word of God said about Jesus was true. And they came face to face with that knowledge. And they saw the power of demons and they didn't want to be left vulnerable to those demons, so they professed Christ and they confessed. Boy, they got serious about him. There was no messing around with these people. No plain Christianity. 19. Many of those also who used magical arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So look at that. The occult books and the occult paraphernalia were all burned. They were burned by the Christians who owned them once they realized just how wrong it was to mess with that kind of stuff. I suppose they could have sold the occult books and the paraphernalia because as I said, you know, the... The occult was and and demonology and and demonism that was very rampant in this area. They could have sold those books and made some money, but even if that money was given to the church, it was still better to burn those books and eliminate their influence from their potential influence from somebody else's life. 
So they took a big financial loss. You know, books were not cheap in those days. They all had to be handwritten. Everything had to be made by hand, including the paraphernalia. So they took that big financial loss because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And that's how you know that your faith in Jesus Christ is real. Jesus says, put your money where you say your faith is. That's a big test. Verse 20. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. That's because the preachers and the people took the word of God seriously. The Christians took the word of God seriously because that's how they were taught. And if you weren't sincere and you weren't dead serious about receiving Christ, you didn't play Christian like it's so often done today. So you had a pure church that was being fed and taught the Word of God, and you had Christians who were receiving it. And boy, when you got that, you got a dynamite combination, and the Word of God started spreading, and souls started coming to Christ. The Word of God grew and prevailed. So again, these believers here, they may have been a small group, group relatively speaking, but they were dead serious about following Christ to the point of burning all that occult stuff and taking that financial loss. So because of their dedication, because people could see that they were dead serious, they must really believe this Jesus stuff. They must really believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven because they're throwing away all this money because of their faith in Jesus Christ. When people saw, along with the written word of God, I should say the proclaimed word of God, written word of God, whatever, but when, when the unsaved people of that area saw that these people were dead serious about God's word being true and about Jesus being the only way to heaven, that brought conviction on them. There is nothing that will convict a lost sinner in your presence more than you living for Jesus. These idiotic modern evangelicals who think that the best way to win a lost person to Christ is to become cool like the world are completely warped in their thinking. Where do they get this from? I know they get it from their pastors and their preachers, but where are they getting that from other than the, the devil himself? That's not how you win people to Christ. You win people to Christ by proclaiming the word of God without watering it down, which they don't do, and living a holy life, a consecrated life, where you sacrifice for Jesus, which they don't do because they're too busy trying to be cool in the eyes of the world. And they think that that's the way to win the lost souls to Christ? What in the world's going on here? The word of God needs to be proclaimed so that can, people can recognize this nonsense. At least a remnant will recognize it and respond positively to it. To be most effective for Jesus, you got to be committed to holiness and separation from the world, not to be a part of the world. We see this throughout Scripture. I don't know if modern Christianity will ever wake up or if they're just too far gone and there's very, very few preachers that I know of that are proclaiming the pure word of God, things that I'm saying right here, the straight word of God. And if you don't have that, you're not going to have any revival. You're not going to have any salvations. 21. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. Boy, there was no coasting for the Apostle Paul, was there? There was no letting up for the Apostle Paul. He was in this Christianity thing for keeps. He was dead set against Christianity for a long time. He fought it as hard as he could. But when he found out it was right, he did a complete flip and he's just as zealous for Jesus now as he was against Jesus before he got saved. It's all out. He's flooring it. And there's no other way to be a Christian. Why compromise the Word of God 
and try to live with one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God. Why do that? Why? It doesn't make any sense. Why call yourself a pastor? Why call yourself a preacher and then water down the word of God? Why you do that? Why don't you get in or out? Go full blast for the world, live your life, die and go to hell. But if you're going to call yourself a Christian, if you're going to claim to be a Christian, if you're going to claim to be a pastor or a preacher, go all out for Jesus, which means proclaim the pure word of God without watering it down. I don't understand this lukewarm business, and neither does Jesus, which I'm happy about, because he said, because you're neither cold nor warm, cold nor hot, nor hot, I'm going to vomit you right out of my mouth. And if I was Jesus, I'd certainly do the same thing. Because it makes me feel like throwing up when I think about them. No coasting for Paul. No letting up for Paul. Great things happened in Ephesus for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's wonderful. That was big. But Paul's going all out for Jesus. So he also sets his sights on other places that need the Word of God and need Jesus as much as emphasis did and still does. He sets his sights on other places, including the big prize, Rome itself. And Paul will work, and he will work, and he will work. He won't like how he eventually gets to Rome. And we'll see that a little later on in this book, coming up actually in a couple of chapters. He's not going to like how that happened, but he's going to make the most of every opportunity because he floors it for Jesus. And again, I say to you, if you're not going to do that, then why call yourself a Christian? Why don't you just go out of the world, in, into the world completely and live like the devil and sin and sin and sin and die and go to hell? But don't sit around pretending to be a Christian. You're not doing anybody any good. You're going to end up in hell anyway. And all you're doing is dishonoring Jesus Christ and corrupting his message and misrepresenting him. Get in or out. That's what Jesus said. In or out, hot or cold, one or the other. I'm along, I'll go along with Joshua. As for me and not my house, we will serve the Lord. Do it. Even if you have to stand alone, do it. Now, what will help you to do it is continuing to study the Word of God. And that's why the Scripture Verse by Verse website is where it is. There for you to choose, click, and listen. Study all of God's Word with me, verse by verse at thebibleversebyverse.com. Choose, click, and listen. Bring your Bible. That's all you ever need. And if you want to be a part of this ministry, truly a part of this ministry, then pray for me in God's Word. That makes you an immediate and very important part of this ministry. Do it right now while you're thinking about it before you forget. And also, when you take a break from studying with me at thebibleversebyverse.com, go to the front page, click the Donate button, and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead, because that also makes you a part of this ministry. Until next time, so long.